Greetings, everyone. I uh, want to welcome all of you to uh, this really exciting uh, webcast. And I'm very pleased to have uh, so many of you register and attend. Um, I uh, want to start out by just giving a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Peter Young. <clears throat> I'm a member of the Committee 100, which uh, most of you know well. And I'm also chair of this uh, uh, Asian American Career Ceilings Initiative. Uh, we've been very pleased uh, that to have had uh, 17, this is the 17th in a series of events that we've held uh, since February of 2020. And they're really aimed at examining the challenges facing Asian, American, uh, Asian Americans in the United States with regard to barriers to advancement in a wide variety of professions. Uh, the goal of this initiative has been to contribute to the already significant efforts of organizations and individuals who have been tackling this issue. There are many well-organized uh, organizations such as Ascent or LEAP who've been working on different parts of this problem. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. What we're trying to do is uh, to contribute and to create a convening mechanism and fill in gaps where there are gaps. Um, this event is a fire chat, side chat interview with an Asian American of Indian descent who is the CEO of uh, one of the leading executive search firms. And I am very excited about this event because uh, we're gonna do a little blend where we'll learn a little bit about his personal history and, uh, and how he in his own family life and, and career dealt with this uh, uh, career ceiling problem. But he also uh, will talk about the role that Hydrogen Struggles plays uh, as it's, it's involved in the selection of senior executives and board members in a wide variety of companies governmental and nonprofit organizations. He really has a unique perspective, which I think is uh, to me very exciting uh, in terms of both understanding, experiencing and solving the Asian American career ceilings problem. Now, we all know that Asian Americans have been underrepresented historically. And although we made some progress over time, uh, there's still a very significant gap uh, that has not been closed. Um, it seems at this point, Asian Americans don't have any problem getting into good schools, but as they rise up and hit the middle ranks, middle management ranks in different types of organizations, not just businesses, there seems to be almost a stalling of the process for a whole variety of reasons. The 16 previous webcasts that we've had uh, have looked at this problem from all different angles. We've had researchers from Columbia, MIT, UC Berkeley talk about the research they do. We've had people who have been in different industry segments uh, talk about the special problems in their industry and what, what, the, what they did to overcome them. And we've had uh, sessions on women in corporations because not only is it hard to be an Asian American, but it's particularly difficult to be an Asian American woman uh, rising up in corporations. Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be a, a one hour session. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to start talking a little bit about uh, Krishnan's uh, personal history, and then we'll shift into his own view of what are the drivers and what are the solutions. And then we'll end uh, with a discussion of what Hydric and Struggles uh, has been doing to try to solve this problem with its clients, but also within, a, within its own organization. Um, so uh, the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker is that uh, we're going to have a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. And the way that you uh, ask questions is just use the chat function and both Krishnan and I will be able to see the questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer as many of them as possible. So briefly, uh, Krishnan, uh, Raja Gopalan is the president and CEO of Hydric and Struggles. It's a household name. It's a global leader in uh, leadership advisory. And although a lot of people think of it as an executive search firm, the reality is they go deeply into leadership assessment, development, organizational and team effectiveness in culture shaping services, all of which are aimed towards how to make organizations more effective and more successful. Uh, he's had 18 years of experience in executive search. He's led many, many, many C-suite and board level searches for global corporations, 
across many industries, uh, as well as giving advice along different dimensions, whether it's leadership, digital transformation, succession planning, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and he led the uh, Global Executive Search Division, and he also led the Global Technology and Services uh, Practice. And, um, you know, having talked to him about his own experiences and what he's done, there is no question that he is a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion and gender parity, both for his firm's employees, but also for his clients. And what I thought was rather extraordinary is what I learned that Hydro Constructibles recently pledged that on an annual basis, that at least half of the board candidates that were presented to clients over the course of the year would be diverse. And that's pretty extraordinary because uh, it's their own initiative aimed at their client base. Uh, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome uh, Krishnan. And you know, I'd like to start out because one of the things is you've had, you've lived this whole process personally, and maybe we could start out and uh, talk about where you grew up, where you were born and grew up. And I mean, you're, you're, you're an immigrant and you're a classic uh, American story. So maybe you could start out at, you know, talk about your, your early years and, 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 uh, and how you came to the U.S. Great. Uh, Peter, thank you for hosting. It's uh, good to be here with you. And I can't see the audience, so uh, uh, thank you those who, uh, who have joined so far and uh, look forward to a nice conversation as well. Look, I grew up in India, uh, grew up in Chennai. Uh, I was born in Chennai, actually, lived in Delhi for a while. And then when I was young, we, uh, we came to the U.S., uh, uh, to Washington, D.C., um, which is actually my home now. Um, and, you, you, you uh, came there for you came there for the weather, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my my father. It's interesting. My father was an engineer. Okay, so not surprising. Um, work, working for the government on on something pretty critical, actually, a water supply, which is one of those things that uh, you know really bridges the great divides of the world uh, and uh, and helps so many people. And he got a job with the World Bank as an engineer working in those days with uh, 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 water supply and kind of that also linked to public health. So that's why we came here. He helped build dams, et cetera, uh, things like that. So my sisters, my mother, myself, we all came here. We lived in a small apartment, I remember, for, for so long. We never had a car. We, we kind of used to take this little push cart and go grocery shopping, uh, you know, really grew up in, the, in, in that context. Uh, and it really, um, you know, at least my, the background of my parents and how we were immigrants here shaped uh, quite a bit of, uh, of my future as well. Yeah. And I guess it was somewhat serendipitous that your father ended up in DC and working for the World Bank, right? I mean, he, his career could have gone many different directions, right? Yeah, it, it could have gone so many different ways. And, and in, in many ways, you know, I think that, uh, you know, some of the parallels of, of, of immigrants and, and, and Asian Americans is, you know, uh, as we came here, you know, the mantra really for us was education, 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 right? I mean, so this was really the, the ticket. So uh, for us, so this was the path. Uh, and <laughs> it was interesting in our family, you know, it was so important that uh, the expectation was that you got multiple degrees, okay? Just stopping with even one uh, would probably, you know, not be sufficient. So there was a, a heavy, heavy push on, on studying. So the options, you know, be an engineer or be a doctor. I don't know if that sounds familiar to, to many. Uh, I know it does to you, Peter. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, we, share, we, we share the same, the same pressure from parents. <laughs> yeah, so, so that was, uh, you know, uh, bit of the pressure, but I'd say a bit more of the aspiration for us as well is how I always viewed it uh, as well that, you know, these were recognized things. These are the only things that besides my father being an engineer at the bank that we really, you know, if I, if I thought about our home environment that we, that we knew other Asian Americans, they were doctors or they were engineers. I mean, we didn't know much else. I didn't know a lawyer who was an Asian American at that stage. So, uh, and this got double reinforced for me really because I used to spend three months every other summer back in India um, with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And 
Costco living in, the, in sort of a dual world and learning from them, they would also be like, okay, study, 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 and, and try to uh, become a doctor or an engineer. Uh, so I took a, you know, but, you know, so those were all the commonalities, I would say, that I probably share with a lot of uh, Asian Americans. I think there are probably some differences in my background as well that I was quite fortunate on as well. But your father, you know, he has, I, I find really interesting about his background because he could have just stop being an engineer and focused on being an engineer and a great engineer. But he ended up actually uh, moving up in the ranks at the World Bank and so forth. I mean, what is it about his own, you know, because in a sense, he was going, he was breaking his way through the career ceiling himself, right, in his generation. So what do you think is it about him that caused him to be able to do that? Because the World Bank is, I know the World Bank, and it's not easy to, 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 to rise up in those ranks, right? Absolutely. Look, I think that, uh, you know, that, that was a difference being able to see him do that. I think it, probably, it influenced uh, my view on, on possibilities in life as well. So, um, you know, he went from being an engineer to an executive over there. Uh, I mean, it took 30 years, a uh, long period of time uh, to focus, but you could steadily see this. And uh, you could really see his broader skill sets that he had that he brought to the table in, in communications, in being able to look at a broad set of problems and articulate about them. I mean, he, he was always great at communication, but he was able to leverage that, uh, the bank. And, and look, uh, he worked so hard. I, ne I, don't, I only remember waking up and seeing him at the table in those days with a big stack of papers trying to go read through it and assimilate all the information that was required. But, uh, you know, he also taught me a lot of other stuff. I mean. He was a very values-driven person, and um, and he would go to work uh, in a. Um, it's interesting. He'd go to work in a in a nice suit, okay, uh, tailored suit, and and then he would come home and he'd immediately go into his Indian garb, okay, <laughs> dhoti, etc., things like that, and he'd be comfortable. So the values were the same, but he kind of uh, you know lived his life as well the way he wanted to, and didn't try to necessarily fit in. I I was kind of lucky, I think in that he had a job at the bank because um, it allowed me to maybe take for granted uh, the diverse international environment of the World Bank, okay? So everybody had a different last name, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they were from a different country. Uh, uh, it was valued uh, to be different and it was okay. And so in a strange way, I kind of thought that was normal almost. Uh, and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, entered the world with that positive mindset almost on that. Uh, and then, you know, you learn along the way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, I was born in DC and ultimately, you know, moved to Japan and then Hawaii and then came back for college. But when I was in DC, we lived in Maryland and my experience was a little bit different. My father was a professor, but my experience was a little different in the sense that we, the three kids, my two sisters and I, we were the only Asians in our school. So we didn't feel discriminated because they, they just thought we were aliens from space, right? So, so they didn't act, they just thought we were an oddity. So we, we never got discriminated against, but on the other hand, everyone in the school was, you know, was, was not Asian for sure, right? Yeah. But tell me then, then what did you end up doing? Because I know then you, 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 you went to school and I think your career went in, in a couple of different ways, right? Yeah, my, my career, yes. Uh, I'm the <clears throat> obvious person to be CEO of a leadership advisory firm, if you listen to my background. Uh, so <laughs> I, actually got, I actually have a master's in electrical engineering. And uh, my first job out of college was to work on satellite communication systems uh, uh, down in Florida. So electrical engineering, I'll be kind in saying the old world for computer science, OK? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's what I did. And, I matriculated from there to business school, uh, wanted to do something different and uh, discovered the world of management consulting, which I did for 15 years before joining Hydric as a consultant. And then uh, as you described, sort of have had a, over the last 20 years, uh, um, you know, uh, a fantastic experience here working on what I consider to be some of the, the, the most meaty issues that we can help companies with uh, human capital 
problems that they've got. Well, one of the things I know we chat a little bit about sort of your experiences and transitions and so forth. And the one thing uh, that I found rather interesting is that you overcame what is a huge problem uh, that most Asian Americans have, which is the lack of a mentor by creating your own system of network and mentoring, which I think actually I'd like you to talk about because it's a good lesson for the people who are attending, which is you don't have to just wait for someone above you to decide they like you and want to help you. You can actually, I guess, create your own network and your own mentor program uh, uh, that, that might actually do the trick. And I think in your case, it was very helpful to you. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, throughout my career, I've, I've um, been fortunate to engage with people and, and try to ask them for, for advice. Okay. <laughs> I learned early, <laughs> uh, you know, my first job uh, as an engineer, by the way, um, uh, I got assigned a project and, and um, I had a technician who was helping. Okay. So here I was, you know, I had two degrees. He had no degrees, actually. He'd been there for 25 years. I was brand new. I'm supposed to design something. And I'm telling you that without his help, I could have done nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a humbling experience <laughs> to, to be like that and to learn from somebody as well. So it always taught me just engaging and learning from others and reaching out was a very positive thing to do. So uh, I did that my, my whole life. And that virtuous circle always came back uh, to help me. Uh, I even did it as a CEO, okay? When I became CEO, I kind of created my own little board of advisors um, that were, had been my clients before and people that I had met and kind of asked them a whole series of questions on, on how to advance uh, my thinking, my career, what issues I would face, uh, et cetera. So um, I kind of applied that principle throughout in terms of thinking about my career uh, in reaching out to others and being able to ask them a series of questions and uh, uh, and and leveraging other people to to provide me with the counsel. I mean, I, I think you have to be humble on that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that uh, one lesson I guess from listening to what you say is, don't a lot of people fall into the mistake of thinking that the only uh, good relationships are above them, right? In other words, I'll just make I'll just impress a bunch of people above. But the interesting thing about your career throughout was a lot of the help that you got in your career came from people below and to the side and in other, and, and, you know, who, who weren't direct reports or you didn't, you didn't report to. And, and I think in, in any organization, regardless of size, that's actually an important observation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the key things is, you know, you know, focus on that job that you've got and making those around you and you successful, okay? Uh, and don't focus on the job, two or three jobs ahead of you too much. Uh, so I think I've applied that principle pretty ruthlessly throughout my career. And, uh, and therefore, you start creating circles and waves of support and people that you help because you're all on the same page and you're trying to do the same thing. And, and you're not trying to, you know, promote yourself too aggressively or anything like that. So I always think about the current job that I've got um, and, and being successful in that as well. Yeah. Now, you, you, you did very well in all phases of your career, but did you face any impediments along the way because you were Asian American that you can recall? And, and, and if you did, how did you deal with those impediments? Yeah, you know, we're going to date ourselves here with this, uh, with this conversation a, a bit because, you know, the world changes, right? I mean, right. Uh, those things which... I probably thought were impediments way back then, uh, you know, aren't impediments in today's world, okay? We're surrounded in a, in a different world, but look, I, I could start with, you know, simply the length of my last name used to be like one of the things that you could get angry about because people are always mispronouncing it, okay? And you could take that the wrong way or you could kind of realize that, okay, it's just a difficult being a challenge and, and, and people are learning, okay? So, I mean, those, those can be flashpoints for a lot of people on going the wrong way on a conversation, okay? Uh, and, and you could view that very, very negative. Religion could be an, another topic. I'm a Hindu, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, most people thought 
Hare Krishna and other things like that. So, you know, it's just people learning uh, as well. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a strict vegetarian. Okay. Yeah. Again, trying to make it in the workforce in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, that was like a rarity. Okay. Uh, the toughest thing I probably faced actually was in my first job, believe it or not, um, of direct maybe racism uh, where um, I, there I was 23 years old and we were going to a, a, a field event, uh, sort of like a picnic. And, and one of the engineers jokingly said, hey, get to the back of the bus, okay? Uh, and by the way, in those days, I was the only person of color who was an engineer. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, fortunately somebody put their arm around me and said, hey, come sit with me. And you realize that the, hey, that was an individual and not a culture. So look, you face all these things and you just try to be straightforward, live to your values, I think, speak up against things at the appropriate times, recognize whether that's an individual or a culture, okay? Mm -hmm. And when it's a culture, run away, you know, is, is my view, okay? If it's an individual, you know, you kind of see your way through it. So, uh, so you have to battle through all of these things uh, through most of your life. And, and as long as you're even keel on these things and, uh, you know, there are, you know, there are stereotypes, et cetera, things like that. But uh, you look, I'm a values driven person and uh, uh, I kind of stand up for, exactly who I am. And I don't try to change those things. As I said, I started off with a viewpoint that diversity was good. Okay. Uh, so I wasn't really trying to narrowly fit in. Uh, I was trying to be myself. Yeah. It is really interesting though, because, you know, in terms of your choice of careers, um, it, it, it isn't always obvious that you chose the easy route, right? I mean, executive search is not famous for necessarily being, you know, wildly diverse right uh and and yet you did so i guess you just sort of said i'm going to do what i feel i really love to do and i'll make it work yeah i mean look i realized when i was in consulting that um the who mattered more than the what i mean the what was incredibly important okay uh the answer to the problem but i found that as i catalog things that wow people make the change so i really wanted to focus on people Right, and, right. And I said, this is an opportunity to do that. I saw it as an opportunity for a person of color to have an impact. Uh, I hadn't met everybody in the industry who looked like me. So that was a, a bit of a leap for me uh, to make. But I kind of felt I could have an impact and I wanted to. And I said, OK, let's give it a shot. And there was some risk that you take along the way. Yeah, no, that's right. Now, let's switch a little bit to the big picture and Hydric. Now, as a senior member and now head of a leading executive search firm, uh, I think you have a very unique perspective that, that others don't have across so many different companies in terms of senior management and boards. So from that perspective, right, uh, what, what do you think, uh, are some of the impediments that you see across many different industries and companies that that Asian Americans should be aware of that 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 they're going to have to deal with? Yeah, great. So look, I mean, these are generalities and they don't always fit. So uh, let me just start off by 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 acknowledging that. Uh, uh, look, there are there are some stereotypes that often can exist in people's minds and the people that you're interviewing with or speaking with and Asians are very smart, okay? They're not good leaders. We don't, you don't, you don't see the representation widely in an area as marketing as an example, sales maybe, those types of things. So uh, there can be all kinds of different uh, impressions that are out there. And I think that one of the biggest things that I see, um, maybe advice I might give here actually uh, on those dimensions is, you know, what, what I see, in, uh, and broadly speaking, Asian Americans now, um, is we're already recognized sort of for being smart. We still go to interviews trying to prove we're smart. Right, right. Okay. I mean, it's just like, a, you know, to me, when I hear feedback from a client, and they typically start like, wow, that's a really smart person. I'm like shaking my head a little bit, okay? Because the person that they meet and they say, you know, I'd really like to work with that person they're going to get the job. Right. Okay. So, so we over-index a bit uh, on that. And we should remember about leadership skills, soft skills, kind of wanting to be able to display 
that side of us, which sometimes can be uncomfortable, you know, uh, but being able to, you know, remember the objective is for them to like you actually, okay, that matters, okay, people don't realize that or, or in the moment they lose that, okay, but at the end of the day, that counts for an, an awful lot, and, and I just think that that gets lost in the narrative, but we have to remember that, that there's all these preconceived notions, but at the end of the day, what wins the game and, and how to think about that. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, whether you're a CEO or you're, you're head of a small group or a division or whatever, your leadership skills can make a big, big difference. I, I just enjoyed recently reading a, a great article about the CEO of Microsoft, Nadella, right? Mm -hmm. And it was about how he changed the culture at Microsoft. And Microsoft, it was, you know, very siloed and this and that and aggressive. And he just said, you know, I want a, I want an environment where people are kind to each other and they listen to each other and they reach out to each other instead of first speaking. And if he changed a culture, right? And, and, and it's at least a lot of people who are at Microsoft feel that's one of the reasons why they've been successful, which is ability to not necessarily say, we're gonna you know, do it this way and, and combative and so forth. So I think whether you're at the CEO level or you're just running a, you know, a, a, a small unit, you can make a big difference, which I think in part is your own philosophy, right? Which is how do you change the dynamic of how people relate to each other? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that uh, um, you know, ultimately leaders who, who can do that, uh, I mean, Tati Nadella is just, He's like an uber example okay so uh, exemplar but uh i think for for anybody you know that's what you look for you look for the ability to influence ability to have a point of view so have some courage okay uh and conviction to their values and being able to drive something and i think ultimately those are the people that succeed uh the the bar on just being brilliant to succeed is just like so high actually Okay, <laughs> that, it, that, it, that it becomes even more challenging. And, and those of us realize we're successful along the way that I can't compete on that dimension, okay? There are, there are too many people who are far more brilliant than me, but I might be able to compete and actually be good on some other dimensions. Uh, and I start working on those skills. Well, my wife and I were at a gala dinner and there was, a, there was an inscribed picture of Einstein with a, one, of his, one of his sayings, and I loved it. It said, the difference between stupidity and genius is their limits, uh, their limits of genius, right? <laughs> <laughs> we bid on that photograph for the thing. We got outbid by a dentist. I don't know what happened. And I guess it's sitting in his, in his dental office right now. <laughs> so um, now leadership, of course, is a big part of what you focused on at, at Hydric. What can you say about the ways in which leaders can impact the development of those people coming behind them, and particularly those who are Asian American or, or some other less representative, you know, uh, ethnicity? Yep. Uh, I mean, summary word I'd use is engage. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, many kind of try to figure out, should I engage? Should I not engage? Is it going to be viewed positively or not. I mean, at the end of the day, I think engage, okay? Uh, uh, you know, um, proactively reach out, bring along other uh, Asian Americans rather than doing it reactively is what I would say. I would say, you know, mentor, and, and there's a difference between mentoring and sponsoring, okay? Uh, being a sponsor is more powerful actually than being a mentor. It's like you put a call on somebody's behalf proactively to say, hey, I heard about this job. I heard about something going on here, I think this person would be amazing for it, okay? And when you do those small little things and you're credible, you're a leader, they have an amazing impact as well. And, uh, and take that responsibility to be able to, to do that. So I think that's probably the, the biggest thing that uh, people can be doing is engaging, advocating, and it's okay to do that. I mean, you realize, I mean, I'll give you, um, you know, a couple of examples here, you know, you realize that groups have special issues and topics that are definitely worthwhile investing in and advocating for. We created a advancing women's excellence group inside of Hydric because we realized that there were some issues that we were having, probably one of the best things we did, okay? Um, 
because that group's able to really advocate for each other, talk about it. We built a whole sponsorship group on top of that that exists inside the firm. And it, it's been terrific for us at, at, at Hydric. But it goes to show you that, that groups like that need the special attention as well, OK? And that that's OK. It's good, as opposed to, you know, I'm giving special attention here. I'm not over here. You can always, as a leader, kind of feel that conflict. But it's a good. Right. Well, you know, it's really a challenge if you're involved in management organization, because even if your goal is, in fact, to create an equitable path for, say, Asian Americans or another ethnic group, you know, everything you do comes with something, something that goes with it, right? Unintended or intended consequences, you know, I mean, you know, affirmative action, for example, is a plus, but then it creates resentment, you know, on the part of the people who are not part of that ethnic group and so forth. So how do you, how should organizations, particularly companies and non because you serve not just companies, you serve nonprofits and, yep. and so forth and government, you know, how do they make that trade off? Because a lot of the programs that people put in place, they also have some, you know, some something negative that comes with it too, right? Yeah, but, but I think it's sort of where we're moving to is a recognition that um, diversity and inclusion is a, whether it's a nonprofit or a business, that it is a benefit, that uh, it drives better performance, uh, it's good for the company, so, uh, and it's good for the people, okay, so it's good for all the stakeholders, so that realization between studies companies have done and people's practical experience is coming to a fruition. So, so I, I think at the end of the day, you know, companies are more and more beginning to think like that, and they know it needs to be driven from the top of the organization as well. It needs to be systematic. It needs to have metrics. It needs to have investment. Okay, you're not going to get to, you know, climate change goals without investing in that. You're not going to get to these goals without investing in these topic areas as well. Okay, so uh, it's not a it's not a, a, a it has, comes with great benefit, but you have to invest, you have to put it into your budget. And people are beginning to think about that very differently, I think, which is what's going to drive the change that's going to be required. Uh, it is a journey, okay? I mean, uh, that's, you know, it just gets reinforced over and over as we look at the numbers that it takes a while. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's, we have to have patience with it as well because these are, uh, people created problems, okay, and people created solutions, and all of those take a little bit of time, okay. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you you mentioned the environment, and a similar issue that companies are dealing with is ESG, right? ESG, on this environmental, social, and diversity, uh, it's a broader topic, and what's interesting, though, is I think you put your finger on it, which is there has to be fundamentally a belief that it's not a, just a win-lose, that, that, right. that, you know, that, and I think people have come around to understanding that diversity, in fact, does have business benefits and organizational benefits. I mean, this country would not be where it is if there were if we didn't have the immigrants, right? Without the immigrants who came to this country, whether it's the first wave of G Germans and Irish, whatever, this country would never have succeeded. And I so there's a recognition of that, and that's the same thing. ESG, they're trying. They're the CEOs are getting their mind around saying, you know, something maybe the company on many dimensions the better off. And I, I think they're feeling that way about diversity. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's the whole conversation around, uh, uh, around stakeholders, okay? I mean, so this is a win-win. It's great for your shareholder. It's great for your community. It's great for your employees, okay? And people are beginning to see that all of this comes together uh, and, and that's that's how people are beginning to to lean in. I mean, there will be skeptics, uh, but there are more metrics on this, and there are more studies. And 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 I, and I I generally look our statistics and the corporate emphasis that we feel on it is very real. Okay, uh, is what I would say in terms of where corporate America is at least leaning in and what they're asking from hydrogen struggles on this topic. Yeah. By the way, you have kids, you know, and I have a son. Tell me, uh, how did you deal with ra raising them and helping them succeed? And were you like your father, uh, you know, in some of the advice you gave or 
I, I hope you didn't tell them, please be a science, a, a doctor or a scientist or an engineer. No, you know, I mean, look, uh, we were, we were the first generation here in different stage, different time, different pressures, you know, unlike my parents, we weren't spending, sending money back uh, to India. Okay. So, you know, life is different. You're at a different phase and, and we're blessed and fortunate on that. So, you know, my philosophy has always been figure out what they're passionate about and almost overinvest. Okay. Uh, into that to see if they're really passionate or not and, and allow them to be their best in those areas. So um, that's, that's been our philosophy regarding our kids and they're on different paths. And, and, and sometimes those, investments are exactly what spurred them to the next level of interest. And sometimes, you know, they realize pretty quickly, okay, I'm not going to be world-class in that, or I'm not going to be competitive in that. So I'm going to do something else as well. So realizing what you're not going to do is as important as realizing what you're going to do as well. So, um, you know, we never told our kids be a doctor, be an engineer. We just kind of said, Hey, you know, try to find your passion. Yeah. Well, my father and mother were traditional old fashioned Chinese parents and they, 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 they went at it, you know, saying you got to be a doctor or professor for like a long time. And in fact, I think I told you the story that they got really, they wouldn't talk to me for a while because I decided to go to Yale instead of MIT, which, you know, MIT to them was like the cathedral, right? So forth. But they finally came around and realized that at the end of the day, what I was interested in wasn't bad. It wasn't, you know, unethical and they should support and we were the same way, like you, with your children, with our son, same thing. We said, what is it that you, you really love to do? And we want to enable you to get there. And maybe the things to be successful in the profession that you want are very different from, from, from ours, but we're going to try to help you, right? And I think that is, you know, at least not the only way, but it's one way, right, to really help the next generation succeed and not hate you, right? <laughs> Right. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give to, uh, you know, now a lot of the people in the audience here are at different phases of their career, some already successful, some in the middle. What advice would you give to those who are starting out or in the middle stage of their career in the industry in terms of, you know, succeeding and, 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 and getting up the ladder, right? Yeah. Look, I, I mean, I guess you know, my experience would lead me to kind of say, look, um, take on, seek some roles inside of, I mean, you probably have some areas that you're working in, industries, et cetera, but, you know, take on different business leadership experiences if you want to be a leader, okay? There's an assumption here that, that uh, we're talking about leadership types of roles, uh, cross-functional, uh, multifunctional experience, I think is good, particularly at those stages of life to be able to, to learn about that. So go and do that. Uh, work on just not only your technical skills, but your leadership skills, you know, embrace who you are and what makes you, you, okay? And that's really important, okay? To understand that about yourself as well. Um, find the people that, you know, you wanna emulate, okay? You gotta maybe go find those people a bit and uh, they don't have to be Asian. Uh, they don't have to, you know, exactly look like you, but look at their values and, and what do they represent and, and then ask them to sponsor you uh, as well. So I think, uh, you know, look, you have to manage your career. Um, you have to be proactive is the way I'd like to say about your career. I mean, the person who's in charge of the, your career is you. So, yeah. so take some ownership for that and, uh, and, and be a little bit vocal as well. So there's nothing wrong with that as long as you do it the right way. Yeah. No, I, I strongly believe, and I think your point you made about you have to know yourself and you have to be objective about yourself. And I think that's before you even think about what career you want and so forth, you really have to be honest about yourself and you have to surround yourself with some friends who are willing to be honest and tell you, well, you know, you may think you're really good at blank, but you're really not, but in a nice way so that you don't go down a path where you're never going to succeed because it's not a good match, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's look. I, I probably get calls and talk to people who are pretty senior uh, level people, maybe not CEOs, but a couple notches down and they say, I want to pivot from my career to this thing over here, something else different. I want to do something different is what mm -hmm. they say. 
And I'm like, well, why are you going to be good at different? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and they just stop and they go, okay. <laughs> You know, let me think about that. I said, why are you going to be good at different? Why are you going to be competitive at different? Why will you win at different? And what will make you happy? You know, will losing make you happy? Or is being successful part of happiness? You know, you know, well, what is it for you? So you ask them a bunch of these hard questions. And, and, and there's some aha moments for people as well. But almost everybody sort of starts off thinking the grass is way greener on the other side. Yeah, and sometimes people don't understand what what the problem is, as opposed to you know, I mean, I give an example. I mentor a lot of uh, folks, and and I and I gave a, 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 some advice to this Asian American male who had been now it was third large investment bank, and he was really unhappy. And and each time you know he was skilled, but he was unhappy. And he said, now I'm going to go do something totally different. And I sat to him and I said, well, what is it that is the problem for all three? And we talked about it and we realized the problem wasn't, was that he was at a large company with lots of politics and he hated politics. So I said, your solution is not to go into some other profession consulting. Your solution is to go to a smaller boutique where politics are not key. And, but he was staring in the face. He just never realized that was the problem, right? But the same thing, you know, you, you, you ought to choose wisely and figure out where the real problem is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Hydrogen Struggles takes this issue of diversity in managing board rates very seriously and committed to doing its part to make sure that industry, government, nonprofits make progress with regard to this career ceiling, glass ceiling problem. Tell me what some of the, the, the initiatives that Hydric, uh and Struggles has done uh, some internally, but also externally. I mean, I think you, you're doing some things that normally companies wouldn't necessarily say, oh, this is, this is something, you know, we're responsible for changing, right? Yeah. So look, uh, Hydric, you know, I'm proud to be part of this organization for 20 years. Um, it's always talked about uh, diversity and inclusion. And I think five, six years ago, we kind of really stepped it up. Okay. Um, um, and, and, and what we did was we created a pledge, okay, first in 2018, in fact, okay, and we basically said, uh, it's, called, it's our board diversity pledge to help boards accelerate their progress. We basically, as you mentioned before, we said that we would present only fully diverse slates and aggregate over the year, and we would measure ourselves. So we measure ourselves uh, annually on that. Uh, we're at 67% last year, okay, so we feel really good about the slates that we're we're presenting. And in fact, in the US, our placement rate on diversity is over 60% right now. Okay? Mm-hmm. And we kind of took the same approach that if you can't measure it, and we can't talk about it, we're not going to change it. And we did that, not only with board searches, we kind of went down into all of our searches. Mm-hmm. And we said, okay, we want to do that. And we started measuring it. And we have seen measurement, discussion, conversation, drive change. And our results um, in the U.S. right now, um, over 51% of all of our placements in the U.S. are diverse, okay? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it was standing at about 35 to 40% before, okay? And we've moved the dial on this. Uh, so we have a DEI practice that we've stood up, which works with clients on a wide range of issues, but we apply that same methodology and process to Hydric as well. OK, mm-hmm. so that because we know that having a culture of inclusion is really critical to helping us do this. Um, as I mentioned, we've created groups inside uh, that we never had before uh, and put budget associated with that to align the interests and to sponsor and to help people kind of, you know, just have a place to go to have the right conversations. We've got ERG groups and we've got groups like this Advancing Women's Excellence that we formed. We've got a similar one for uh, African Americans now. So we're just going right through and and, and making sure we invest appropriately uh, and we spend our time, you know, talking about the set of issues that we bring forward our metrics uh, visible to the form to the firm as well for people to be proud of it as well. Okay, uh, and 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 be able to uh, to drive our performance that way. And we've applied that lens to our recruiting efforts. Uh, 
we've got a ways to go on that still. Um, but in terms of uh, recruiting and making sure we've got a diverse talent pool as well. So yeah. we're trying to double down on this and all on all the uh, angles possible. You know, if you look across companies, there are obviously a wide variety of of cultures and philosophies across com uh, companies. There's some that, you know, have been embracing diversity and others, shall we say, are, you know, not, not as enlightened. Do you get pushback at all from any companies with regard to, you know, say, well, why are you showing me so many, you know, you know, Asian Americans or whatever it is in, 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 in your, in, in the work that you've done? No, we don't get that, that pushback, but I think there is a, um, I think there may be selection bias still happening. Okay. Right. So we haven't been able to, you know, solve that problem and we're trying to step up to solve that problem and coaching ourselves on, okay, when that happens, what's the conversation Hydra consultant should be having. Okay. Right. How do we advance? Well, so, so we think there is a problem there. Okay. Uh, to be clear. Okay. Um, I don't think we've cracked the nut on it. So we're trying to educate ourselves to say, okay, what, how, how do our best people advance the ball in this case? And how do we train the rest of the firm? We're actually working, like, for example, with, with NASDAQ now, uh, just in a partnership, really, to, to help them engage on DE&I uh, so they can talk to their clients about it, okay? It's as simple as that. We want to advance, you know, work with them in the marketplace on some really cool things that they're doing. Uh, uh, the pledges that they've made, the initiatives that they're saying, and they need help. Uh, yeah. to, so we, we're, we're kind of giving them our intellectual capital and training and trying to help them as well. Yeah. And although it's helpful that the CEO is a woman, right? And yeah, uh, uh, she's Adina. yeah no, she, and she's terrific, you know, she's really terrific, but it helps, right? Because, you know, things come from the top. Um, so in, you know, obviously, uh, Things are changing, and and I guess uh, will these changes in industry? Do you think they're going to create, on the positive side, uh, new opportunities for Asian Americans? I mean, certainly as just one example, uh, because so much growth was in China and Asia, that clearly helped a lot of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans because they had a special either cultural or language skill, and and companies needed help in terms of building up uh, their business in China, for example, as an example. There's an example where change in industry really helped, right? Uh, you know, uh, Asian Americans. Can you think of things that are happening that maybe are creating good opportunities that otherwise didn't exist? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I look, so I think that the domestic opportunities because the demographics of the US are changing, okay? So uh, we're talking about, language skills that I don't think is going to be around the language skills. It's going to be around the culture and the target communities and, and what does the landscape of, of, of the U.S. look like. And I think that in itself, just natural progression wise. I mean, look, as an Indian American coming here back in the late 60s to today, it's a different world, okay? <laughs> you know, in terms of serving that community, how big the diaspora is, Etc. So I think the opportunities that will get created for the Asian American community just multiply simply as a result of the diaspora that exists in the U.S. itself. So I'm optimistic on that, and that's the representative population that you have to be able to resonate with as well. So that's that's your target audience, if you ask me. Now we have a couple of questions to the audience, and I encourage the audience sure. to type in questions. The first one is from uh, Buck G, who I know is a friend of mine, who is a member of Committee 100. Uh, has the NASDAQ board diversity rule uh, been effective in changing board recruiting? And Christian, you might explain to the, not, not everyone in the audience may know what this NASDAQ board diversity rule is, but uh, if you could define it and then comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a rule that they put in place that sort of says that every new company that list needs to uh, to have diversity on their boards, and they try to, you know, depending on the size of the board, they try to say, here's how many diverse members you need to have on the board. So it's a new rule, okay? So again, new journey. 
and they're implementing it, okay, as far as I can tell. So I think it, and new companies that are beginning to list, okay, and think about this, they're all getting educated on it. So I don't, I, I don't think that uh, it's easy to say that it's, uh, it's changed all of board recruiting or anything yet. We're at the very early stages, you know, we're sort of working with them on, on simply education and training, okay, so that people understand what this means and how to think about it. So uh, there's a long ways to go. Yeah, and, and how are they implementing it? Are they, are they reaching out to the individual companies and trying to encourage? I mean, what's the mechanism yeah. of that change? Yeah, no, the mechanism is, look, I think for, I, I can't speak to NASDAQ since we're not a part of it, but the way they deal with companies, they've got sales representatives, et cetera, who are helping companies list. So you can't list there unless your board complies. But before you get to that stage, you know, companies go through, a big process to list. So they're trying to educate them very early in their process of forming boards, et cetera, things like that. That's where we might get engaged with them to provide them education and training materials on that topic. Yeah. Now there's a, one of the questions here is an interesting question. I, I know Christian, you and I chat about this. Barry Chen says, how have Indian Amer Americans been so successful in corporate America, e.g. Google, Microsoft, Uber, Question mark. Yeah, I think I. <laughs> there, you you had a uh, a panel, didn't you, Peter? Before on who actually studied the analytics of this, and uh, and uh, you know, I think there are some conclusions that you could draw from that. But 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 Barry, I I I think it's it's perhaps you know there. I, I think I think some of it is 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 driven by maybe a stronger recognition or earlier recognition on, on kind of this, this topic of, of working on their leadership skills, okay, uh, as well. Uh, I think sort of the language of we maybe is uh, embedded a little bit more, okay. Uh, so they're there talking about bringing teams forward and how teams succeed. So I think that creates a stronger leadership profile and aura uh, as well. So Peter, you may be able to comment based on. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Christian yeah, referenced a uh, previous webcast we had where we had uh, Professor Morris who is at Columbia Business School and Jackson Liu at the MIT Sloan School and they jointly did about eight studies and they had a terrific uh, panel where they talked about what they learned from the, the, uh, the studies about why Asian Americans have difficulty but also the, one of their conclusions was that Indian Americans do not only do better than other, you know, you know, uh, East Asian, et cetera, but they actually do better than on a proportional basis to, uh, you know, to Caucasians, et cetera. And they explain what the reasons were. And it, it's very interesting. And by the way, uh, all of these sessions are recorded. And so um, uh, if you want to go back, we, we have recordings available of that session, but they, really figured out why Indian Americans were so successful. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and the results were surprising. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily because they look more white because they don't, right? And it wasn't because, you know, and they went through, but it was a certain kind of aggressiveness that, that, that was their conclusion. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it was interesting, right? Uh, so uh, there's a question about, can you talk, uh, there was a recent report about, here it says, a recent report about how careers are going to be much longer in the future, and that companies and employers ought to design careers so that the working professionals in their 40s with small children in their 50s, taking care of their elders, aren't quite so busy at work. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think this is, uh, I'm just reading it as well here. It's a uh, long question. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, you know, I think we're all, you know, really uh, trying to, to, trying to figure this out uh, um, with, with, with how do you create work-life flexibility uh, in jobs and what does the future of work really begin to look like, right? Um, and, and I don't, I haven't seen that study to be able to comment, but I think that, you know, I think on behalf of 
what we're trying to do at Hydrate here. We're trying to be as flexible as we can and learn <laughs> on this topic. I mean, the way we're, we're treating sort of uh, this balance and sort of coming back to work at least and thinking about it is, is not mandating some things, but having a framework that we can operate under and people can have ultimately some flexibility to operate inside of a framework, which is how we're thinking about it uh, for our workers, our people. And we've surveyed them to try to understand who they are and kind of get a sense of, of what their sets of issues are. And we think sort of having a, a strategic approach to it and then allowing people to flex inside there is the best answer for us. Yeah, and you see these things, I think a lot of people think that some of these changes are going to be permanent. They're not just temporary because of the pandemic that is going to change a lot of the, the way people work and, and how they get promoted. Do you feel that way? Um, I, I look, I, th I think everything is, is, is still changing. I think we are learning. Um, if you look at promotion as a thing, I, I don't think we've been this long enough. I think we've been in it long enough to, to promote people. We haven't been in this long enough to know who will have successful careers yet. Okay. And I think those are vastly different things um, uh, to be able to, to, to predict uh, inside of changing uh, of how we work. Okay. So we're trying to figure that out ourselves. Okay. So our promotions have been fantastic, but we haven't had a class that started out as an associate yet and became partnered through this process. So that takes multiple years to happen. So we need to figure that out. Yeah, that's right. Well, we have a number of questions here, but some of which I don't know how to answer. Like someone says, how does one figure out your passion in calling? And I don't, I, I don't have an answer, <laughs> but, but the, it's an interesting question because it's certainly uh, germane. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, the only part I'd say is like, in general, I found people who, uh, enjoy things that they've got passion and call like it. So, so you, you got to ask yourself, am I having fun doing it? And do I look forward to doing it every day? And is it something that I just get excited about? I mean, so, uh, and, and then they have to be good. Usually if, if, if you kind of feel like you want to do that, but you're not good at it, it's pretty soon it falls out of your passion list. Okay. You yeah. know, this positive reinforcement and feedback is a very important thing that we shouldn't forget. Yeah, that's right. Well, look, uh, we're at the end of, uh, I think we hit the main questions that are that, it, that, that, that could be discussed. Um, I want to thank Krishnan for really taking the time to share his perspective on things. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there are a lot of lessons to learn from both uh, your own personal history, but also how you've, uh, you know, how Hydric is trying to have an impact. And uh, I know a number of senior people at Hydric involved with the process you're talking about, and they're very passionate about it, and they're doing a great job. And uh, and and uh, and it's important because if people, if companies like Hydric aren't taking a lead and so forth, we won't get there. We just won't get there, right? Yeah. Look, we've got a platform and an opportunity to 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 make a difference and. Uh, we're very, very committed to doing that. Yeah. So now, Peter, what, thank you so much for hosting me as well. One of the important questions here is this recorded and can we replay? And the answer is yes, it's recorded. And for those of you who would like to binge watch Krishnan talking about his <laughs> personal life, you're going to have the opportunity just like uh, Netflix. And I, and I just want to uh, end by saying we have some very interesting programs coming up. Uh, one, uh, we're pivoting, by the way, to action-oriented uh, 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 activities. So we're, we're shifting now half of our, this, you know, Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings Initiative, it's going to shift now half its energy towards having an impact because we've done a great job, I think, of explaining the problem, giving advice. So we're going to be doing that and around some of the, um, some of the ideas that came out of the conference we had last July where we had 25 actionable uh, items. So first of all, we are, there is a putting together a resource where all of a directory of all organizations that touch on this issue are in there, all the recordings and all events that are coming up so that there's a common resource, that this is a collaborative thing. We're going to have some initiatives to try to expand what is being done in California, which is a program that trains 
Asian Americans on how to how to run for office and then how to be effective once you're in office. And we're going to try to find ways to expand that uh, beyond, uh, you know, beyond California. And maybe Hydra can be helpful in that. Uh, so there, there are things we're going to do, but half is going to be focused on uh, making things happen. Because at the end of the day, you can talk all day long, and that's helpful. But at the end of the day, you've got to make things happen. And for those of you who are on, who want to be involved, uh, please, uh, you know, email us and let us know, because we would love to have your, your involvement as well. So thank you very much, Kristen. You've done, it's fascinating, and I, 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 I really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone in the audience. And uh, I hope you found this very helpful. Thank you, Peter, for hosting me.